I recommend to read the Kim's book to get more information. It's really the book worth to read. Are there any intermediate reactions or comments from other panelists to I'm Kim? Cu I'm curious. So you get to talk a lot about the, the code itself and sort of what it did and what it was intended to do and how it worked. From what you've seen and from all the work you've done on this, did Stuxnet work? So I, I do cover that in, in, in the book. Um, so Stuxnet was discovered prematurely. Uh, it, it, it had remained, um, uh, uh, sorry, stealth uh, between 2007 and 2010. If it had not been caught in 2010, it probably would have had more effect. It had a minor effect on Iran's nuclear program. It's, it did set it back uh, a little bit that first year. Um, I think that most analysts looking at the, the figures, though, would say that it didn't actually set Iran's program back. It just prevented them from progressing that year. And by the end of the year, Iran had caught up to um, where, they, where they would have been anyway. They didn't advance that year, but they certainly, um, by the end of the year, had re resolved the situation. Okay. No. okay, thanks. And I think the floor is yours now. Her, please. All right. How's everybody doing? All right. So um, I'm going to talk quickly to you guys about not Stuxnet. We're going to talk about what happened after Stuxnet, what the implications of Stuxnet were. Um, I have this term up here, millware. This is not intended to be a line in the sand where I want to come and find anybody who disagrees with the use of this term or new term or whether it has any function after the conference and, and have fisticuffs. This is just intended to be a way to capture some characteristics of code that we've seen since Stuxnet, some other families of code that may or may not be related to Stuxnet. So I'm going to give you a quick overview. First, I'm going to talk about what malware is, what these trends are. Second, I'm going to talk about some challenges for what these trends, how would they pose both to policymakers but also the information security research community. And then last, I'm going to talk about a few opportunities that may or may not exist to try to restrain this new type of code, although this is not going to be an uplifting presentation. So first, what is malware? One of the most substantial changes with Stuxnet and with the code families we've seen subsequent to that is that we've seen a shift in states writing code as an industrial activity. So to take hacking out of this sort of one-use, problem-specific, boutique custom space and turn it into software engineering. The Dooku platform, the Flame platform, the Torla platform are sort of three focuses of the talk. Dooku, Flame and Turlo were all intended to be espionage uh, platforms. Each has been compared at one time or another by analysts to an operating system. Right? Talking about Dooku in particular, one of Kaspersky's analysts compared it to a Lego set. You could recombine this, he said, into a tank, into a house, into a plane. Right? This was an incredibly extensible platform. It was not a single piece of code written to achieve one end. Right? It was actually an assemblage of multiple different modules, right? multiple different components, each with a particular focus, each with a particular function that worked together. This is not a new concept for software, but it is something of a new concept for malware. In 1990, Brad Cox wrote a, uh, an IEEE piece called The Software Industrial Revolution, where he articulated a concept of standardized software components. He was criticizing contemporary software development as an arcane practice, much more art than science, where every time developers wanted to solve a problem, they sat down and they beat out a solution, and that became a piece of software. Cox was anticipating the rise of what we know today as software libraries and objective, uh, as, as object-oriented programming, but he was making a point that we should anticipate or we should consider that software development can be more of an industry than an art, that we should consider that developers should have access to a pool, to a marketplace of standardized software components, each with particular functions that they could grab and place into their design at will without having to recreate the wheel every single time. This concept is starting to take hold with government-written code. Right, so this is this first trend that we're seeing in terms of what I'm talking about with millware. States are specializing. They're using teams of individual uh, groups that are taking different parts of a function, different parts of a problem, attacking it and putting it back together. The key problem with this, or the key uh, implication with this, especially with Dooku, is that you can then recombine this code multiple different ways. So rather than having to develop a new piece of code to solve a new problem, I take my Dooku platform, I take my existing malicious operating system, and I add a new module in, right? maybe remotely via a command and control server, maybe uh, near the point of attack right, with a USB stick. But I don't have to re-engineer the entire solution. 
The second piece of this, right, sort of moving away from these bespoke applications like the Morris worm or the blaster worm, which were works of art in some ways, but were works of individuals and were works to solve one problem, is this transition towards specialized individual development. FireEye in 2012 wrote a report on the Sunshap quartermaster attacks. These were a group of Chinese, they used the term advanced persistent threat, I apologize for repeating it here. These were a group of Chinese espionage uh, organizations that were sharing code. And that FireEye speculated were actually working from a single common developer base. That someone was actually building them and tweaking code for each of their individual needs without having to go back and build a new piece of code every time they found a new problem. So this is this first implication with malware, that we see standardized code development. Code is a platform rather than a solution to a single problem. Second is we see a change in the manner of propagation. Malware focuses on persistence to a degree that we haven't recognized before. Right? The idea of a backdoor has been around since the beginning of worms. Right? Individuals who compromise systems often want to go back to gain access. Kevin Mitnick, uh, one of the original phone freakers, when he was hacking in the 1990s, was notorious for leaving backdoors into large industrial systems, large research development computer networks, so we could come back and store files there. Because at the time, in the late 80s and early 90s, these were the only systems that had substantial storage capacity anywhere on the net. What we're seeing here is propagation not as a way to get access to a machine, right? It's not simply finding a way to get Stuxnet into a computer that's connected to a programmable logic controller, but maintaining access, guaranteeing sustained access to that system. So the equation group, uh, a piece of code that Kaspersky recently took apart, uses a, uh, a concept called firmware flashing to actually compromise a hard disk and to rewrite the, uh, the firmware on its controller chip. And it had 12 separate manufacturers' firmwares that it could blow, depending on the target that it found, and take control of. This is an outrageous investment in time and material in terms of technical capability to have your own custom firmware for 12 different manufacturers. This is not a problem of simply getting access to a simple. It was a problem of maintaining access. So that's issue one, right? This propagation has become a permanent fixture in these operations, for these malicious software operations. The second is compromising internet trust infrastructure. So as we saw with Stuxnet, but also with Duco and Flame, there were efforts taken to actually undermine existing trust relationships, certificate signing is a major one, in order to gain access to systems. This is two separate problems. The first is certificate authorities, centralized repositories, which act to verify transactional relationships between computers, right? These are the certificate authorities that underlie the existing SSL and TLS infrastructure. Right, of the internet. The second was certificates being used to sign particular forms of code. So this is where attackers would imitate companies like Realtek, right, or CE Media in the case of, of Dooku. They would actually appear as if the code that they were putting on a machine was signed by that original developer. So what's the problem here? This is not a new thing. This has been going on for probably the last five to 10 years. The Zeus Trojan, absolutely not a, a piece of state written code, right? Compromised an Adobe web server in 2011 in order to propagate more effectively, right? They were able to generate a certificate using that server, attach it to their code and propagate without getting picked up by existing virus infrastructure, antivirus infrastructure. So what's new? The problem with this, the new element to this, is that states can work at a scale that most criminal groups do not have a hope of accomplishing. So when states pour resources into compromising the trust infrastructure of the internet, it creates a systemic insecurity by which we cannot necessarily expect that the next time we go to take a certificate from a company like DigiNotar, right, or Komodo, Komodo still operates to some extent, DigiNotar was put out of business uh, by a hack which compromised its internal certificate signing infrastructure. We may not necessarily trust that these certificates are legitimate. So the issue is that states are working at a scale that undermines our trust in the infrastructure, not in a particular certificate or in a particular company. So these are two broad trends. Developing code as a platform and propagating as a permanent process, right? Trying to undermine this sort of trusted infrastructure. What are the implications? The first, when states are buying this software, when states are building this software, it creates incentives to acquire and stockpile components for these software. So Kim does a great job in the book sort of talking about what pieces go into malware, but there's sort of three generalizable components for us. The propagation method, the payload, and the exploits supporting those two pieces. Without the exploits, for a contemporary software, you're, you're probably not going to gain access, right? But whatever these are, these are there to take advantage of features or flaw in the software to allow you to manipulate system resources. You need exploits in order to allow the propagation method and the payload to function. So states have begun to churn through and to attempt to develop exploits to get after multiple different kinds of software on multiple different kinds of platforms. 
over a wide variety of versions, over a wide variety of configurations in order to be able to function, in order to be able to deploy this malware on systems. So the issue here is that when states begin working at scale, and they're not trying to solve a problem, but they're trying to create a capability, one that's consistent and dependable and effective, they begin to encourage a growth in the market, both gray and black, in these software components. Companies like Vupen and the hacking team are incentivized to create capabilities and sell them to governments without necessarily disclosing them, in many cases, to software vendors. Within the black realm, right, it's possible that governments are buying from groups that we would see as unsavory, if, assuming you're allowed your, yourself to see Vupen as savory. It's possible that governments are buying from criminal organizations. Regardless, it is definitely the case that governments are buying in the same forums as criminal organizations. And this has an impact. We're not sure what it is. So this is an area for further work, right? So anybody out here working in academia or industry wants to talk about this, there's a lot to be done here. But we know that states are buying in the same areas as these groups. What, incentive, what impact does that have? Does it bring more sellers into the marketplace? If someone who, has, who can pay a million or two million per exploit comes in and prices out all of their buyers, somebody goes back to his buddy and says, dude, I don't know what you're doing, but drop out of school and start fuzzing with me. Let's start banging against commercial software and let's go get a million dollar payday. Because setting up a botnet, as we've learned, is, is probably a bad deal. Right, so this is incentivizing changes in the marketplace, both in gray and black. The end result is we have more people trying to compromise software and keep it secret. Right? Because something you can sell in these markets is something that's not known to the software vendors. The second is the proliferation problem. And this is something we talk about all the time when we talk about Stuxnet. States are going to build a capability. It's going to be intensely destructive, and it's going to trickle down to non-state actors. This may or may not be true. Right? Again, we talk about our three components, the propagation method, payload, and exploits. Payload's really hard. Right? Stuxnet's payload was immensely complicated. It was the result of thousands, if not tens of thousands of years of uh, hours, excuse me, of engineering effort, right? To build, to test, to test again so that it would work autonomously, right? This is a piece of code you've got to put into a denied territory, to enemy territory, expect it to function without any or little to no input from the user, right? You can barely get your word processor to do that. So this is a tremendous change in the way we're operating. The proliferation problem with payloads is difficult because these payloads, especially when they're destructive, tend to be written to a very particular end, to a very particular purpose. So is it possible that somebody could take Snuxnet, right, fully unobfuscated at assembly level, turn around and recombine it or reuse it in their own device? Probably. Is it likely? Not so much. And that's the challenge that we have in looking at these payloads. Now, if we're not talking about destructive effects, if we're simply talking about espionage or some other effect that you can do on existing commercial software within a Windows operating system within the Unix kernel, then this reuptake process is much more likely. If we stop talking about payloads and are talking about exploits or new vectors to propagate, then it's very likely because this code does get out there. And it is easy to take a known exploit and to re-engineer it and put it into your own infrastructure, to put it into your own code. So the proliferation problem is probably less about states building very sophisticated weapon systems that have destructive effects, and more that states are able to do the research and development to come up with incredibly cool ways to propagate code, and incredibly unusual ways to keep that code functional on target systems. And that does get out. Because at the end of the day, you do have to put this on a target system and have it execute. And once that happens, you lose control of the capability. Right? This is not like an advanced fighter. This is not a, a warship. You can't call this thing home. You can't protect it from inspection. Once this code is put on a machine, it is necessary that it be revealed in some function right, for it to work. It must execute on the target machine. So there is a proliferation problem, chiefly being that states are now able to work with the sort of time at scale, monetary resources, and human resources that non-state groups can't match. So there's a lot more stuff out there in the wild. OK, now is everybody sufficiently bummed out? There's two maybe interesting things that, that we could get to try to control this. This is a picture of the uh, small diameter bomb 2, uh, the GBU-39-2. This is a US munition that was developed to offer a capability to weapons planners that was smaller, right, as a 35-pound warhead, that was better targeted than existing aerial munitions. The idea was that you could constrain the effects of a weapon 
and could more particularly target this weapon in order to avoid the risk of collateral damage, in order to achieve the capability that you wanted without any sort of ancillary effects. The SDB2 is an example of the sort of possibility that exists within Stuxnet. Stuxnet is a code, a piece of code, a piece of software that has the paw prints of lawyers all over it. Right? I don't know if there are any JDs in the room, but you can see that the degree of effort that was taken to constrain its, its propagation to particular targets, the manner in which it executed, the timing of which it executed, was specific to the degree that there was likely some legal authority evolved in directing those changes. This offers the prospect for what are called target limiting factors. Artificial limitations in the capability of a weapon system written in code that constrain its target or scope, right, so the, the way that it propagates using that first component, or its payload, the effect of its operation. One of the reasons I asked uh, Kim about whether or not Stuxnet worked is we have this idea in our minds that a weapon system is intended to provide a full range of capabilities. In the kinetic space, that may or may not be true, right? Uh, heat and overpressure can provide a number of different effects within a single platform. With code, we're looking at very particular effects. And so it's possible for us to start to tune those effects in very particular ways, to adjust rotor speed instead of gas pressure, for example, or to change a breaker rather than the rotation of a turbine, as in the case of a generator. This is the opportunity. The problem is that this is all asking for voluntary restriction of capability by states. So whether or not that's likely is up to people smarter than me and potentially in the other room. The second possibility or the second idea that Millware brings in, this sort of standardized, consistent production of code by states, is how we restrain state behavior. So you have this image up here. Right? We have the idea of global health, a network of NGOs, of institutions, in some cases states and individuals that share information about the latest outbreak right, in an attempt to contain and control the spread of infectious diseases. This is, to some extent, the existing model that we have for information security. Right? Symantec, Kaspersky, any number of other firms, Dambala, get up and they find a new virus and they update the signatures on their software. Right? At some point, those signatures start to spread to other platforms, to other, uh, to other company software. We're attempting to share, to some extent, information as long as it's still profitable for us to operate to keep infections off of systems and to cure infections where we find them. This is difficult when states get into the game. When we're talking about malware, we're talking about an environment that's more akin to biological warfare. Not a, an amorphous, constantly shifting threat space, but particular capabilities being engineered by conscious and adaptive adversaries. This requires a change in our thinking as well, not just in the institutional framework, but in our paradigmatic conception of the space. How do we restrain states from developing certain capabilities? How do we restrain states from pursuing and propagating those capabilities? It's difficult to do, right? That, that challenge is difficult if you're an NGO or an individual or even a private company. We have very limited leverage. The problem with Millware is that it inverts the traditional hierarchy of information security where the malicious actor is illegitimate. When the malicious actor is a state, they are by definition legitimate. So this pulls at the fabric of the way we write and enforce existing computer crime laws. It pulls at our conception of how information security firms can function in this space. Now, the solution here, again, is that there's not a good one. But there is the prospect within biological weapons, potentially within nuclear weapons, for an institutional arrangement that allows for monitoring and enforcement of states by other states. But that conversation hasn't really started. When we talk about the, GGC, uh, the GGE, uh, the UN's global group of experts, the idea of a set of norms or a code of contact, this discussion is at a very early stage, right? it's at a very abstruse level. It has come nowhere near the specificity, the technical specificity required of something like an international arms control regime. And that doesn't even begin to address the fact that this is a far more opaque space than even biological weapons, and certainly than nuclear weapons. It's very difficult to find the infrastructure that's building these capabilities. Could very well be in this room, right? Could very well be on somebody's USB stick. So this offering this, this idea of biological weapons as a new model is not to bum everybody out, but to make up the point that our existing conception of the institutions and the paradigm that's in place to defend ourselves is inadequate. It's not to say that a new model is clear, but the existing one that we have isn't fitting the bill. So key takeaways. First, states are building code like companies build operating systems. 
There are distributed teams that are specialized. There are common code bases that are being extended to different models. Think, if you will, for a minute about the B-17, the American strategic bomber in World War II. Over the course of the war, there were 15 different versions and variants, each of which was modified to fit either new updates or to, to apply for a particular mission. Right? This is the way that we're seeing malware develop now, common uh, designs if you will, that are modified to fit particular requirements. Common designs are updated over time without having to rebuild or come up with an entirely new aircraft. Second, propagation is no longer just about immediate need, but ensuring sustained access. Right? The equation group firmware flashing in particular is an example of this. States want to be able to turn on a capability, not have to find their way in and then deploy it. Part of this, and, and this becomes an interesting point of conversation, but part of this is because a lot of the existing cyber war programs to use that term, and I've tried hard to avoid it, but a lot of existing offensive information security programs are being run out of intelligence agencies right, in these various state governments. The attitude of a military organization and an intelligence organization overlap in some ways. They also differ in key ways. And this idea of developing access, developing sources, and maintaining access to these capabilities is to some extent an extension of this intelligence culture, which may or may not change as these programs evolve. Third, states are building and buying code. We know that, but we don't know how it's going to encourage people in the gray and black market to change their behavior. It's possible that it's going to increase the number of people banging away against commercial software and trying to keep the results of those activities secret. Fourth, proliferation of code is a problem. It's less about payloads because it's, it's not always enough to know what to write. You need to know how to write it as well, and that's a difficult barrier for a non-expert to jump. Right? The particular versions of a Siemens PLC how many people have the expertise in those systems to actually understand how to manipulate them? Right? But it is a problem for proliferation with propagation methods and with exploits, because these necessarily are released when code executes. Fifth, design requirements may be a way to control malicious software, targeting about targeting limiting factors. And sixth, it's difficult to regulate state behavior without the involvement of other states. Right? And at this point in time, they're not involved. That paradigm hasn't changed. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Trey. Thank you very much for your very convincing uh, presentation. And after that, it seems that the race of the malware is as unavoidable as the emergence of Internet of Things. So it's, it's my thinking that consequently these two factors actually will shape the, the future of cyberspace and cybersecurity. Thank you. And finally, uh, the floor is yours. Jason. Thank you. All right, so uh, about one year and two months ago, I was still an officer in the United States Army. I was a captain at the time, uh, assigned somewhere in the depths of United States Cyber Command. And about that time, uh, Russia was invading Crimea. And a report came out that said, all of a sudden, uh, Crimea's communications were cut off. It was like magic, right? It just happened right before the invasion. It was perfect. Um, and I asked myself, well, what, what, could have, what could have Ukraine, what, what could they have done, right? Like, what, what were their options in this case? And I came up with the logical answer that probably many of you came up with. Well, they couldn't have done anything. Ukraine is a relatively, you know, smaller, less powerful state when compared to Russia. Uh, I went back a few years, back to uh, Estonia, 2007, and I asked myself the same question. Well, what could have Estonia done? Could they have deterred Russia? Could they have changed their behavior? And again, I came up with the same logical conclusion. Well, at the time, they could not have done anything. So I, I asked myself what came to be a, an interesting question. Um, how do you achieve cyber deterrence if you are a potentially smaller or less powerful state? So that was kind of the, uh, the premise of how I went, went about this study. So before I did that, I looked at the uh, four prevailing views. And uh, I found that they tend to be along one of four lines. First is that cyber deterrence is difficult, but it's achievable. You know, if you have perfect attribution, if you can do it within legal norms, and if you have a, an effective capability, yeah, sure, you can deter another state, right? So when you think of this, you think of, you know, great powers such as the United States, Russia, China. Of course, those three countries could deter other states from doing bad things to them. But again, it didn't, an it didn't answer my fundamental question. How could a small state do this? Uh, so I looked at the second one, uh, it's in the second viewpoint, that cyber deterrence is difficult, but probably not achievable, because you would need perfect attribution. You would need to find the exact machine. You would need to find the aggressor. You would need to know how they did it. The, the burden of proof 
would be overwhelming. Uh, the third view I found is that cyber deterrence is simply not, it's not legal, right? Because in order to develop a deterrence capability, you would have to either threaten the use of force or develop a capability that would violate the UN Charter's uh, prohibition against the, UN, the use of force. And then lastly, the third possibility that I've found that was pre prevalent in the viewpoints is that cyber deterrence is neither possible nor desirable. Why would you develop a cyber deterrent capability if you could simply do other things? Um, so in summary, I found three principal challenges. The first one being the development of capabilities, the second one being the attribution problem, and the third being conformance with international and domestic legal norms. So in this brief, and also within my paper, within the book, I, uh, I address each of these three challenges. So I came up with a hypothesis. Um, that being that a nation state, regardless of its size or military strength, can achieve cyber deterrence if it can hold an adversary's critical cyberspace security objectives at risk by communicating its own retaliatory or autonomous cyberspace capabilities. So there's two key phrases in there, and these are intentional within my hypothesis. The first being, regardless of its size or military strength. And I'm going to contend that this is possible in cyberspace, because cyberspace, your, your power in cyberspace does not necessarily depend on the size of your military or your budget. Rather, it depends on human ingenuity. And the second key phrase in this hypothesis is cyberspace security objectives. And I'm going to go into this later on in the brief, but I believe that if you can hold these key things at risk, then any nation, regardless of its size, can actually deter another nation through cyberspace. So, in general, we're going to find that capabilities can fall in one of two buckets. They are either retaliatory or autonomous. I'll go into this later in the brief, but a retaliatory capability is basically, you hit me and I hit you back. Or you have a capability to hit me and I threaten you with a capability that I can somehow damage your interest. And the other would be the autonomous capability, where I communicate to you that, hey, if you hit me, I have this thing that will automatically sort of damage your interest, so you just don't want to do it in the first place. Uh, and again, I'll go into each of these, but those are in general the two types of capabilities that I discuss. So now we're going to go into types of nation states and their cyberspace security objectives. So I went, I, went, I went and studied this a little bit, and I found that in cyberspace, there tend to be four different types of nations. Uh, the first would be those with more sociopolitical cohesion and less cyber power. The second being those with more sociopolitical cohesion and also an abundance of cyber power. There's those with less sociopolitical cohesion and less cyber power. And then lastly, those with less sociopolitical cohesion and more cyber power. I have examples listed on the side, but in general, what I found during my studies is that each of these different types of states, they exhibit different behaviors. And based off those behaviors, you can actually identify what they value as their most significant cyberspace security objectives. And so now this kind of gets to the meat of the presentation. Um, in US policy, we often promote the promotion of internet freedom, the availability of services, um, other, such, uh, other such things, right? Combating cyber criminals. And we publicly announce these as our cyberspace security objectives. Um, I think this is common amongst Western states. Western states in general want freedom of the internet. They want free commerce, the exchange of ideas, the secure exchange of ideas. Um, those, are, those are generally very common. And I would argue that these are positive cyberspace security objectives, that without these things, that the, the fundamentals of how Western states use the internet, the fundamentals of what we need for commerce would collapse, or it could collapse. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum are negative cyberspace security objectives. So these things, unlike the positive cyberspace security objectives, no state would publicly declare these, right? No state publicly declares that they restrict, restrict internet freedom. No state publicly declares that they promote lawlessness in cyberspace or that they are a supporter of state-sponsored industrial espionage. Yet, any of us who follow you know, any sort of international relations news or global news in general, we know that there are states who fervently support negative cyberspace security objectives. We don't need to name them. We know exactly who they are. But I would argue, and this comes down to the fundamental premise of cyber deterrence, that if you have the ability to understand these security objectives, and if you have the ability to hold them at risk, you can deter these states from their malicious behavior. So now we're going to go into the three principal challenges of achieving cyber deterrence. So the first one of these is developing a capability. And again, this goes back to the argument of, you know, well, what could a small state do? How can a small state possibly deter a larger state? Well, I would argue that if you understand your adversary's cyberspace security objectives, then it's really not that big of a challenge. 
So like I spoke to you in the beginning of the brief, we have two fundamental types of capabilities. The first being retaliatory. So again, you hit me and I threaten to hit you back. Let's pretend I'm a small state and I am trying to deter a larger state from doing something aggressive towards me. Let's pretend my adversary is a, uh, a large nation that censors its population that prevents them from looking up certain things. Well, what if I developed a capability to where I could enable externally hosted access to a search engine, to where that state and that population could look up anything they wanted to? That would be, uh, that would be quite the capability, would it not? Um, if I could threaten a larger state and say, I could fundamentally alter your population's perception of your government, and if you don't stop doing X, Y, Z, I will unleash this capability. I believe that would be quite the deterrent. And I don't, think that a, I don't think that you necessarily have to have a lot of money or a large military to execute that deterrent. On the, other end of, on the other end of the spectrum would be the autonomous capabilities. So these are capabilities that are going to be unleashed no matter what. Um, the example that I gave here was that, let's say, a, a firewall with an attached intrusion prevention system that, say, you were to conduct an attack against me, I would do a, rever a reverse lookup of all IP addresses and automatically broadcast those to either law enforcement or to the media or whatever. So this goes back to the naming and shaming concept, right? Another example, and this one would be probably slightly more devious, is say I'm an organization that uh, I produce intellectual property. Well, what if I had a honey net? And let's say my honey net were seeded with malware. And if you were to try to steal my intellectual property and take that back into your own network, it would autonomously erase your systems or would autonomously open up a back door into your own systems, thereby making you vulnerable to espionage from wherever you stole from in the first place. So again, this would be an example of an autonomous capability, not something that I think requires a lot of money nor a large military, which is why I would argue that these are, would be fundamentally uh, valuable things for small states to pursue. So the next challenge that we found is attribution. Um, and I, I think in general, especially from the technical standpoint, we have this fixation on attribution. You must find the exact computer. You must find the exact aggressor. And I, I don't think that's necessarily true, um, especially with state-on-state -state relations. I believe you can conduct attribution in tiers. Um, it's fairly easy to figure out which nation something, in, something uh, originated from. Even easier, or not, not easier, but within the realm of possibility, you can figure out a region. You can figure out a city. And then with enough, with enough technical capabilities, you could probably get down to the group or the level of individuals. But I would argue that you don't even necessarily have to, you don't have to get all the way to the bottom, right? If I can hold a nation accountable, why can I not execute a deterrence capability against that nation? Say, if you do not control the behavior and the actions of the people that reside within your nation, or the criminals that choose to use your networks in a certain way, I will execute a deterrence capability against you. Um, and this kind of, uh, this brought me to quote several, uh, or a couple things by Jay Healy. Uh, the first one being that analysts fall into this attribution fixation. Again, like I said earlier, I must find the exact computer. I must find the exact person. Um, I believe in terms of nation, nation statecraft, um, I believe these are fallacies. I don't think you necessarily have to find the exact computer, the exact person. To bring it back to a nation would be good enough for a deterrence capability. And then another quote by Jay Healy. Um, we have this, this tendency to treat every nation as, you know, as Jay Healy, Jay Healy uh, noted there, as cyber Somalia, to where nobody, nobody can do anything about what's happening within their own borders. Again, that's not true, right? It's an excuse. Especially if you're a first world nation. If you're a nation that you know, exercises advanced capabilities and you have you know, a certain amount of you know, technological capability, you can certainly control what is happening within your own borders. And if not control it at the moment, at least prosecute and do some sort of follow-up after it. So again, I think the cyber Somalia excuse is a fallacy. And then going to the uh, spectrum of state responsibility, Jay Healy listed uh, 10 different types of state responsibility to where even if you, don't, you aren't necessarily responsible for what is happening within your state or responsible for the exact actions, you still have a certain level of accountability, which again, going back to the premise of needing attribution for cyber deterrence, I think if you could attribute back to any one of those 10, you can execute a certain level of cyber deterrence or somehow at least express the capability to, to some extent. And then lastly, one of the last challenges for cyber deterrence is conforming with international and domestic legal norms. So within the Talon Manual, they go as far as to divide between what would constitute use of force and not use of force in cyberspace. So obviously use of force, you know, actions that kill people or damage or destroy objects. 
Another one would be providing an organized group with malware to conduct, conduct a cyber attack or other such things. Um, but there are also several actions, and I would argue that these actions that are below the use of force threshold are probably the most effective actions. So for example, conducting psychological operations to undermine the confidence of a government or economy. So I can think of a few examples of this, uh, going back to the one I used earlier. If I could open up just a, a Google search engine, an unrestricted Google search engine to a nation that, that censored its population, that would be an enormous, enormous capability. If I could enable unrestricted access to social media, to some of these governments that restrict the use of social media, again, that would be an enormous deterrent capability. Um, and these things, at least according to the town manual, fall clearly below the use of force threshold. So therefore, by developing these capabilities, you would not actually be violating international law. And then lastly, um, for these capabilities to work, you have to abide by domestic legal norms. So at least in the United States and several other Western nations, unauthorized access of non-owned machines is considered illegal. So if you were a, let's say, a private entity, maybe an autonomous capability would more suit your needs to where if somebody comes into your network, oh well, I had something bad, I'm sorry you took it, but that was not intentional, that would be an example of a deterrent capability. Or in some cases, like with uh, US federal law enforcement or military or the intelligence community, which are authorized to use malware in the process of national security operations, they would be able to use different types of retaliatory capabilities. So the point being on the, on the uh, bottom rung there, it's rather important to make sure that not only are you abiding with international legal norms, but you're also abiding with domestic legal norms. So in the, within the spirit of this panel, I took on the question of, well, given deterrence and given how the world has developed since Stuxnet, uh, what are the possible roles that cyber weapons might play? Um, and I came up with four different outcomes. And these are, obviously these are not, you know, these are not exhaustive. There's probably far, a lot more, a lot others, but uh, just from my observations, both in the military and the private sector, here's kind of, kind of what I've seen. Um, the first being mutually assured destruction. So it is possible that you know, we develop these capabilities. Uh, I have a deterrent capability, you have a deterrent capability. We each threaten each other with this deterrent capability. And as a result, we develop peace. Uh, essentially, that's what happened with the Cold War, or at least in theory, that's what happened with the Cold War. Um, but I would argue that one of the things that kind of prevents against that, at least within the cyber realm, is once you declare a capability, once you reveal a capability, is it a, can you even use it at that point? Uh, would, would the defender not develop a defense against it? Um, so that's why I'm, I'm a little bit unsure on the uh, mutually assured destruction hypothesis. Uh, the second one would be the use of cyber weapons in surgical strikes. So I, I see this as quite likely, um, especially with, uh, if you look at the, from a US perspective at least, the, uh, the way the military is shifting to a smaller, leaner, uh, more surgical force. I would argue that cyber capabilities will be developed to complement those types of operations. So I could see the use of cyber capabilities along with special operations, uh, low intensity conflict, um, things to that effect. And I think, uh, a lot, especially with a lot of Western nations with, this, uh, with an appetite, if you will, to not get involved in another Iraq or Afghanistan, I could see these types of capabilities being developed within the cyber realm. Another, uh, another hypothesis of, how, of the direction that we could go in would be misdirected and unattributable chaos. So I think unlike, unlike nuclear weapons or some of these other conventional capabilities, the development of cyber weapons has the, has the possibility of quickly spiraling out of control. Um, you, it's relatively, I, I wouldn't say easy to develop a cyber capability, but it's inexpensive. It's not the same as building an ICBM. It's not the same as maintaining a missile silo. Um, and because, because of the ease of, of development, I think you, you risk this, uh, this ex escalation, if you will. And in many cases, and, and probably in the most likely case, it would be an unintended escalation. So two nations squaring off against each other, unintentionally releasing capabilities or distributing capabilities to a less stable third-party actor. Um, I think that is something that could potentially be likely if, you know, if cyber weapons were to continue to develop. And then lastly, um, the last hypothesis I would look at is uh, the use of cyber weapons by non-state actors as a sort of equalizer. And this, one somewhat fri this, uh, this, this uh, scenario somewhat frightens me. Because, I mean, if you think about it, what, what would be the ultimate equalizer for a non-state actor or a terrorist organization 
that probably could not afford some of these more high-quality kinetic weapons, but could potentially afford or gain the ability to conduct a devastating cyber attack. Um, you know, why, why set off a, if you're a terrorist organization, why set off a nuclear suitcase bomb and go through the, the troubles and the, the difficulties of acquiring such a weapon when you could deliver a cyber attack against the financial sector or against the energy sector? So I would argue that given the ease of at least gaining these types of weapons, I think non-state actors will, will at least consider it as a possibility, if not a reality, in the near-term future. So in conclusion, um, my argument on cyber deterrence is essentially that you need four things. And it doesn't matter whether you're a large state or whether you're a small state. If you achieve these four things, you can deter an adversary through cyberspace. First thing, like I said earlier in my brief, is you need to understand your adversary's cyberspace security objectives. What do they hold near and dear to their hearts? What do they need for their government to persist? What does their military need in order to continue? How are they held at risk through their population? If you can answer these key questions, that would be how you'd understand your, cyber, your adversary's cyberspace security objectives. The second would be a capability. So again, um, this, this goes back to the retaliatory or autonomous capabilities. If you can develop a capability that can hold the cyberspace security objectives at risk, then you're in the game at that point. Again, it doesn't matter whether you're a small state or a large state, you merely need to develop the capability. The third would be a moderate level of attribution. Do you need to find the exact machine that executed the attack against you? No, you don't. Do you need to generally know what nation it was coming from or what region was responsible? Yes, you do. And I would argue that those types of attribution capabilities exist even today. And then the last thing that you need is you need to conform with legal norms. So again, developing a capability that might kill or damage property, kill people or damage property, obviously not legal in accordance with the UN charters against the, or the prohibition against use of force. However, psychological operations, things to that effect, uh, those are in play. And I would argue that different types of psychological operations, if leveraged through cyberspace, would probably even be more effective than those types of cyber weapons that could damage you know, property or people. So again, in conclusion, those four things, if you can achieve those, I would contend that you can achieve cyber deterrence. And uh, that is all I have. Thanks. Any burning questions or comments from the other panelists? No? Uh, thank you very much. I really have to admit that probably I belong among those people who tend to believe that the deterrence in cyberspace is difficult, if not impossible. But however, uh, I think that understanding the cyberspace security objectives is certainly one of the key questions. And it's in many contexts, actually, and not only in the context of the deterrence. And thank you for bringing this idea into the discussion. I think that there is something. And now, thank you for your patience. But let's start with Q&A session. First question. See, I wanted, to, I'm uh, Jamie Collier, University of Oxford. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys about the implications that uh, Stuxnet has on public-private partnership. Um, you mentioned a bit about the Simmons and uh, the Simmons software that was involved, and Iran has publicly accused Simmons of colluding with the US and Israel. Uh, whether that's true or not, what it does mean is that there's uh, mistrust between uh, certain private sector firms. And this maybe builds on what you were talking about, uh, state coordination with uh, non-state actors. So do you think that uh, states will can, uh, start to look more, more inwardly in the sort of private sector, uh, the sort of private sector firms that they in uh, interact with? Let's collect one or two more questions and try to address them then. Uh, over there. Ah, okay. Yeah. My name is Thijs Veen, also from the uh, CCDCOE. Um, I'm going to make it for myself easy. I'm going to basically re-ask a question Kim Zetter asked Admiral Rogers this morning, in which she so expertly dodged answering. Uh, maybe you can uh, give a better answer to that. What is the impact, the long-term impact, of the U.S. government, they say, hearsay, uh, um, 
intruding on or compromising the core security systems of their private enterprises, which are so vital to their uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, well, how would it impact the, the, the nature of cyber conflict, the nature of espionage in the long term? Okay. Kim, would you like to start? I think that uh, Trey answered uh, part of that question. Unfortunately, Admiral Rogers didn't address the question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, he talked about undermining the trust um, in, in the case of Flame in particular. I think that it's, you know, it's one that we know about, so it's a good example to bring up. Um, and in that case, Flame, which has been attributed to the U.S. and Israel, it's a spy tool. It used a trusted Microsoft certificate in order to impersonate Microsoft software and get onto systems. Um, but it not only undermined the uh, Microsoft certificate, it undermined the Microsoft security update process in order to trick a system into thinking it was downloading um, Microsoft software from the up upload, uh, from the up update. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you're getting into that realm, what Trey talked about is, you know, these are, these are critical infrastructure in, in, in essence. Um, uh, security updates in particular, digital certificates are part of our infrastructure, are part of our trust processes. And although we don't, we already have some trust issues with digital certificates um, in general, that system itself is broken. Um, when you add to that uh, nation states sort of willy-nilly hacking into legitimate companies or undermining certificates in other ways, you really do undermine um, you know, what we currently count on. Uh, so I think that the long-term result of that is uh, that people will, will stop trusting trusted systems. And I think that um, you, know, you can expand on that where you think that that's going to go if, if there aren't any limits. We talk about in the norms of, of warfare and the norms of cyber warfare, but we talk about generally in, in terms of what's off limits in terms of critical infrastructure. You know, certain facilities would be off limits or using uh, another nation's computers as a proxy to launch an attack. We talk about those kinds of things that are off limits, but I haven't heard the discussions about um, undermining our trusted systems in order to launch attacks. So I think there's two answers um, to some extent, as, as Kim is pointing out. The first is, and Ms. McKay made reference to it this morning, that there is a critical information infrastructure, right, that's being targeted when we talk about the certificating process, and it's much more adversarial than uh, when we're talking about developing exploits. So I think part of the distinction is we've accepted that software is insecure, and so to mine vulnerabilities to create exploits is, although it may be disingenuous for governments to be doing it, not disclosing it to vendors, is a somewhat accepted part of the adversarial process in cybersecurity and information security. Certificates are a little bit different because they are not as common, and I think not as seen as standard, a point of vulnerability in this infrastructure. So uh, in terms of targeting the sort of internet communications chain of trust, long term it may very well result in uh, state-run CAs and certificate authorities that are not held or not organized by non-governmental uh, non organizations. In terms of signing for vendors, I think what you're already beginning to see in the case of Flame, right, the uh, fraudulent certificate there resulted from a cryptographic attack, right, MD5 hash collision to recreate a Microsoft certificate. Microsoft has begun using more sophisticated uh, cryptographic algorithms as a result. They're improving their implementation. Uh, they are finding more uh, sophisticated, more resilient to brute force attack algorithms to integrate into their platforms, and that's happening across a suite of vendors, so both in terms of data at rest and data in motion. Um, so I think the result is that there's going to be something of a cryptographic arms race in particular between these vendors and the uh, state agencies that are attempting to gain some access into these systems to violate this trusted process. And just quickly on the public-private partnerships question, because it's a really good one, I, I think it'd be, I'd be confident in saying the government's not going to change its behavior until it sees a material decrease in the amount of cooperation that's receiving from private companies, right, does not receive uh, advance notice of exploits before they're patched or samples of, of operating system software or even collaboration uh, from companies. It's, it's debatable whether or not Siemens actually participated in any direct uh, activities with the government. I mean, it's hard to be hard to prove it. Um, you, don't, you wouldn't necessarily need Siemens to come and hang out at Sandia National Labs for two weeks to really understand uh, their systems in that way. It might be beneficial, but uh, I think until the government feels the pinch, until they know that they can't get private sector actors to cooperate with them anymore because of this, uh, 
there's no incentive for them to willingly give up capabilities or willingly increase their cost to acquire capabilities in order to do that. So I'm going to take a, a point of view that's probably opposing to Kim's as well as uh, many of those in the audience probably, and that uh, Pandora's box is essentially opened. So uh, you could argue whether the United States did it or somebody else did it or whoever may have done it in the first place, but uh, in my personal view, I would rather those capabilities and that box, if you will, be held by the United States, Western actors, actors with a historical reliability than non-reliable actors, non-reliable states, organized criminal groups, groups which are certainly seeking those capabilities. So I suppose it's a, a, a view of preference that it's going to happen no matter what, and I would take the view that I would rather a stable and consistent actor have that capability than a non-stable and a non-consistent actor. Yeah? Thanks. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation, Trey, um, but I really feel compelled to follow up on that <laughs> last observation. Uh, <laughs> so I, I probably I. <laughs> share your ideal um, uh, perspective, but uh, how would you, do we have cyber stability now? Uh, Pandora's box is definitely opened, but the other side definitely has the tools as well. Um, so really, what's the relevance of stating your desirable opinion? You mentioned in one part of your presentation the impulse of the intelligence agencies to keep resources open and to keep, keep doing these things, and that's a really powerful thing that's happening. So there's almost no restraint on the increasing cyber instability that we're seeing. So how, how would you address that? So when you say cyber instability, I, I, I personally do not see an, an increase of state-on-state -state cyber instability. I mean, if you look at what, what is the last ta attack that had a physically destructive capability, Stuxnet, and it hasn't happened since. Um, sure, there's been a few things here and there, but it hasn't collapsed society. All these predictions of cyber Pearl Harbor and cyber apocalypse or whatever term you want to use, those things have not happened yet. And I, part of that is because of, again, because we are, we are aware of, and I, when I say we, I just mean Western governments as a whole, just a general awareness of the capabilities, and because of those awareness of the capabilities, people can now create systems and defenses that are at least conscious of what's happening. So yes, it, it has been released, but I think in general, society has reacted quite well to it. I don't think, we're, I don't think we are worse off than we were in the past. Yeah, please. Thank you, uh, Vladimir Adunovic from Diplo Foundation. So um, um, uh, connecting with what Trey um, reiterated again, and I think it's quite clear, that the most um, dangerous parts of the cyber weapons actually originate from cyber crime, which is the botnets, the uh, proliferation parts of the malware and so on. So on one hand, as you, as you said, we have um, the misuse of these opportunities by the governments stimulating the, cyber, the dark markets. On the other hand, we have quite a number of, or quite a process, global process when it comes to negotiations about combating cybercrime, including some of the conventions like the uh, Budapest Convention of the Council of Europe. So how do we kind of reconcile the two if we can? And I guess that's a question for all of you. Uh, can we put more emphasis and somehow force the governments to move to more towards discussion about combating cybercrime and that way combating the most dangerous cyber weapons as well, in that way, in a way, preventing misuse can we simply move the pendulum to that side? What's your opinion? Just, just one thought, um, uh, and I think Jason made reference to this in the conversation we were having earlier. There is, there is always going to be a necessary national security capability uh, and an exemption that's granted to that by any state. So the problem with phrasing it as an issue of crime is that it presupposes that there is a higher authority to generate uh, both a law to be broken and some sort of punishment to be enforced. I think a, potentially a more productive tack might be to accept that, and because these are primarily espionage capabilities, they already exist in this nether space between crime and national security, uh, a potentially more di productive direction is to accept that these capabilities exist and that they are systematically developed and deployed as part of the array of state capabilities that exist, as, as Emma Rogers pointed out this morning, in all domains uh, of conflict and of national security enterprise. And rather than trying to block them or to try to leverage uh, Budapest, which certainly exists, but I, I think 
we could get into a great discussion about its utility and its sort of power uh, in a contemporary, from a contemporary standpoint, that potentially a more productive approach might be to shape these activities rather than try to stymie them and to accept that they exist and to uh, alter the normative framework in which they exist. The way to do that, I, I think, is going to come down to another international agreement. There's been a lot of this discussion has focused through the Wassenaar uh, uh, arrangement discussions. There's been uh, revisions in 2013. There will probably be some more discussions in the next plenary session. Whether or not that's useful because it focuses on capabilities that are primarily, uh, again, being leveraged by individuals and non-state actors is, is debatable. But I, I, think it's, I think this is here, and it's here to stay. Uh, whether or not we can have an impact on it is more about a, a shaping discussion. Would other panelists like to add something? No, I think There was a question here, please. Hi, Alexander Klimberg. I'm going to follow up with another question to Trey. Really enjoyed the presentation, but I just want to make sure I understand that you were recommending uh, an arms control agreement based on the Biological Weapons Convention. And if you were, uh, as someone who works a lot in the global norm space and works with the global uh, the government group of experts that you referred to beforehand, our problem has been that it's unverifiable. So therefore, everybody has avoided the BWC except for the Chinese who really like it. Um, and if you are just looking at a no-use policy, then that actually is not covered in the BWC, but is covered in Geneva Convention. So what was your actually preference there? So I, I think that the biological TAC is a framework, as a mental framework. I definitely don't think the Biological Weapons Convention is going to serve as a functional institutional model for something in this space, because arms control is, is likely impossible, because verification is likely impossible. Again, um, putting aside the raft of dual-use issues that, that come in this space. Uh, I think the intent of that is to consider that there is a model of state-to-state -state standard setting and enforcement that isn't currently present in the information security space. Um, when you talk to information security companies and researchers, you get a sense that there's, a, there's an, an ongoing battle uh, between researchers and attackers, and that that is, uh, is sort of a naturally evolving dynamic in capabilities and in sophistication of analytical tools and forensic capabilities but that that is difficult to extend into states because the resource gap between attackers and defenders at that point becomes so stark. Uh, I think that the, what the model is is unclear. Uh, that states have to be involved in it in some way seems to me at least to be uh, a concrete beginning for some proposal. Uh, a note just in terms of Geneva, right? any, any sort of uh, law of armed conflict type provision, again, getting states not to use a capability that they found that's effective and that they're beginning to trust uh, for certain missions, I think, is a difficult challenge. As you point out, right, there's a degree of, of variety in terms of the opinions of the Chinese, the U.S., the Russians, and coming to the table, uh, both in terms of willingness to deal as well as opinions themselves. So solving that problem is, is definitely above my pay grade, um, but I think it seems, from, from my perspective at least, that states are going to have to be involved. Yeah, please. Uh, C.J. Horn, National Defense University, Washington, D.C. This is directed toward, towards Ms. Zetter. Um, in your research, have you identified anything where Stuxnet might have been part of a larger campaign plan about slowing down the Iranian nuclear capability development process? Part of a larger sabotage campaign or? Just part of, well, we tend to identify things as in isolation. Mm -hmm. You know, here's Stuxnet, this has happened, blah, blah, blah. But was there anything in your research that indicated that this was part of maybe of a campaign plan, just one piece of a much larger concept about how to manage this? Yeah, Thank so uh, the discovery of Stuxnet allowed uh, researchers to then identify other pieces of malware that were created by the same groups. Uh, Duke, Trey mentioned, is one of them. Uh, it was discovered in 2011, it's a spy tool, and then in 2012, Flame was discovered. Um, and all of these used, um, had similarities in the way that they were designed. Some of them used the same algorithms, some of them used the same zero-day exploits. Um, there was also another interesting piece of malware that was discovered, created by the same crew, called Gauss. And what, um, what the, the, the group shows together, Flame was a larger, a really huge spy flat platform that could be used for multiple operations. Um, but it looks like when you look at the victims that were infected with Duku and the victims that were infected with Gauss, it seems to point to sort of a larger campaign um, coming at the Iranian nuclear program from different directions. Gauss, for instance, uh, was very interesting. It had a banking Trojan component, and that banking Trojan only targeted Lebanese banks. 
Um, so it was looking for anyone who had uh, an account with a specific Lebanese bank. But it also had a payload that w has never been unlocked. It's, it's very... Um, it, it's very secure. It uses algorithm that hasn't been cracked, or so it uses encryption that hasn't been cracked. It can only be cracked by a key that's created from very specific configuration that's on the targeted system. And without knowing that information of, of who that target was, uh, the payload has never been unlocked. Um, but that also, uh, all of these were targeting things like, uh, you know, if it's targeting Lebanese banks, then it's looking at how money was laundered. Uh, for the Iranian nuclear program, possibly through Lebanese banks. Duku targeted uh, uh, some uh, um, Nigerian companies. Um, and there's cooperation there with Iran in military and, and in, in its nuclear system. So it was part of a larger campaign of at least four other pieces of malware we know about, possibly others. Uh, I don't see any more questions, and as we are exactly on time, exactly on time, then let me thank all the speakers for their presentations and for sharing their thoughts with us. And I also like to give you as a small reminder from this year's Saikon, a small present, as you probably have seen. These are very special handmade marks. Could I have these marks? So, thank you. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you all of you for making this panel work. And I, we have finished here, so I wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank you.